Welcome everyone, my name is Fred Kaiser and I'm your host here at the Fast Team National Resource Center, FA Production Studios at the Sun and Fun Complex here at Lakeland, Florida. For and it's, I, I know this is going to be just an absolutely exciting time because our next presentation is called Meet the FAA. And without any further delay, because I know you guys just from talking to you have a lot of questions, I'd like to bring out Mr. Doug Murphy, who is a Southern Region Administrator for the FAA. Doug. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Meet the FAA at the 35th Annual Sun and Fun Fly-In. Uh, you're sitting today not only in the uh, FAA's production studios, but you're at, for this week, the world's busiest airport. It's a great treat for us today, and uh, those of you that uh, had the opportunity to join us last year will remember that we had a, a distinguished member of Congress uh, come and visit us, and uh, he's back with us again this year, Congressman Vern Ehlers, a uh, member of Congress. He's also a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. But uh, he has some exciting things to say, and I'd like to mention that uh, uh, the Congressman, based on his strong support for aviation, general aviation in particular, and the uh, partnership with the FAA has taken on an interesting challenge in the last day called the General Aviation Caucus. And I'll let him explain a little bit more to you what that is. So without further ado, it's a privilege and an honor for me to introduce Congressman Vern Ehlers. Congressman Ehlers. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I came last year and uh, I'm hooked. So I came again this year, and I keep seeing things I didn't see before. So I guess I have to come back again next year. Uh, as you heard, I am on the aviation subcommittee. I'm very interested in flying. I learned to fly when I was a student at the University of California many years ago, and gave it up as so many do when the when the children came, and the wife, of course, first. Uh, just got to be <laughs> just got to be too much uh, of a burden on the budget. Uh, but later in life, I'm back again taking lessons. But I'm just very, very interested in aviation and very proud of general aviation. As you just heard, we uh, just formed this week the General Aviation Caucus. Now, I don't have the time to really explain what that means, but it's just a group of like-minded individuals who get together on issues. And so I'm signing up people who are interested in aviation. The reason I, I got into this is I was astounded at some of the comments made by some of my colleagues, and I won't say any names, but both House and Senate, at the time the folks from GM flew into Washington in their private jets, and there was a storm of protest about that, and a lot of people who didn't know any better extended that to everyone in aviation. So I decided I had to start fighting back and make sure the truth got out there. Uh, some of the ab absurd things I heard uh, I won't pass on to you, but I decided many members of Congress don't really know what aviation is. And uh, I was worried about spreading because I don't know if you've heard this, but already the state of Oregon has had a bill introduced to declare an airplane, airplane a luxury. And Illinois has a bill introduced to make airplanes a luxury, which wouldn't mean that much except that it allows them to be taxed as a luxury. And I was afraid that would start spreading. So at any rate, I decided it was time to take action of finding some like-minded individuals to form this caucus. We will bring in speakers. We will bring in pilots. Hope we can bring in Harrison Ford to talk to my colleagues and explain what aviation is all about, particularly general aviation. I, um, <clears throat> I also, by way of introduction to the FAA employees who are going to be speaking here, uh, I, I know, well, sometimes when I'm trying to warm up a crowd uh, back home before I get in the speech, I always say, well, I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help you. That's guaranteed to bring a laugh from the audience. Uh, I would never say that about the FAA. In fact, it doesn't apply really to the government because they all work very hard to try to do their duties. But the FAA particularly impresses me. Not only are they dedicated to the job, they are dedicated to aviation. And just listening to the conversation on the plane coming down here, all of them are pilots or 
have been pilots, they really understand aviation, they know what they're doing, and their goal is to improve aviation. So keep that in mind whenever you have a complaint about aviation, uh, and particularly the FAA, uh, just stop and think about it a minute. Put the faces on it that you'll hear today. These are people who love aviation, want to make everything safe for you to fly anywhere, anytime that you want to, as long as you meet the, uh, the statutory requirements and the rules. So uh, I'm proud to be associated with these federal employees who work at the, for the FAA. And I hope all of you uh, will really take advantage of this opportunity to not only quiz them on what they're doing and why they're doing it, but also uh, thank them for what they do, because they work very hard, long hours, trying to improve aviation. I will not, by the way, defend the Transportation Safety Agency, which comes up with all these silly rules about what you can do with your airplane, what you can't do. And the latest one is to require you to have a passenger manifest uh, just the way the airlines do when you get on an airliner. And so we're fighting that now. But the FAA we've always worked closely with, and uh, we hope it won't take too much longer before we settle the, the next gen problems and find the money to get started on that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a fellow pilot. And it's all yours, Doug. Thank you very much. Let me introduce to you now the, uh, the panelists for today. They'll be joining us shortly. And we've got a great turnout, not only the people that you'll have on the stage, but uh, those in the audience. We've got uh, standing room only at the back. I hope that's a testimony to the quality of this session and not the fact that we're air conditioned and it's 88 degrees outside. Or maybe it's both. But uh, let, let me ask the panelists to join us now. And I'll introduce them and then say a little bit about the format for this. Uh, the first gentleman on my right is John Duncan, who's the manager of the Air Transportation Division, FAA headquarters. Second is Randy Fierce. He's the director of airport compliance and field operations for FAA. Uh, we have uh, Dennis Roberts, who is the uh, director of the flight service program. And uh, this is kind of an interesting dynamic for us because it's the first time we've had somebody that can talk with you about the flight service program. Uh, we also have Kim Smith with us. She is the manager of the small airplane directorate and uh, very actively involved in uh, these uh, aircraft that are near and dear to everybody here in the audience. And finally, Wes Timmons, who is our national director for, for runway safety. So these are our five panels. I'll let you sit down for just a moment and let me introduce uh, on the front row here, and I hope I can catch everyone, ask you to stand just briefly uh, representing the FAA. We have Suzanne Alexander, who's the acting uh, director for en route and oceanic operations for the eastern U.S. John McCartney, who is the uh, area director for terminal operations for the eastern third of the U.S. Uh, we have, uh, and I'm kind of skimming through my notes here, Terry Bristol. Terry is the new vice president for technical operations for the FAA. She has a, a minimal responsibility. She's responsible for making sure every piece of equipment in, in the whole country is working and working safely and productively. So one of those low, low profile jobs, not much involved with that. Uh, and we're certainly happy to have Terry. Uh, Gene Crabtree is with us. Gene is our uh, acting director for technical operations for the FAA Southern Region. Uh, we've got uh, Ann Graham with us. Ann is the division, acting division manager for general aviation and, and uh, the commercial division. And we have uh, Dr. James Frazier, who is the Deputy Federal Air Surgeon. Perhaps you caught his uh, session earlier today. Uh, Don Veach, who is the Flight Standards Division Manager for the FAA Southern Region. Dr. Susan Northrup, who is our Southern Region Flight Surgeon. And finally, Susan Parson. Susan is the editor of FAA Aviation News. So uh, we've got, got a great panel today. As oftentimes happens, the staff provided me with about a 10-page speech. I'm going to dispense with that because we've got a full audience and we want to hear from you in addition to giving, giving you an opportunity of a, a snapshot of what's going on. Let me just say a couple of things. We talked about the world's busiest airport, an average of 40,000 operations during sun and fun in Lakeland. It's also the world's largest aviation trade show, 500 exhibitors. 
and there are more than 400 forums and training sessions uh, during this week. So it's a great opportunity to, uh, to come and to learn and to spend some time and uh, provide your energy to uh, the general aviation community. Uh, we're looking at a couple of challenges still. When I talked with you last year, we talked in terms of uh, waiting for a, our next FAA administrator to be identified. That has finally happened. Uh, Captain Randy Babbitt, who has a distinguished career in aviation and uh, aviation law and uh, labor relations, has been nominated by President Obama to be the next FAA administrator. Uh, he is going through the confirmation process, and we anticipate that his confirmation hearing will occur in early June. So we're looking forward to uh, uh, Captain Babbitt's uh, con confirmation so that we can start calling him FAA Administrator Babbitt. Uh, we're still working with the uh, reauthorization aspect of FAA, making sure that we have a steady funding stream uh, for the future. And we're currently in our ninth extension of the authorization uh, by Congress since it expired at the end of September in 2007. Uh, the extension it goes till the end of September, the end of this fiscal year, but we're encouraged because it appears the Congress, both the House and the Senate, are scheduling hearings and discussions probably as early as next month to move this forward uh, to a productive conclusion. So a lot of interesting challenges, uh, but uh, let me stop at that point because we've asked each of our panelists to keep the remarks short, three to five minutes. And what we're going to do, we're going to do things a little bit differently this year. After uh, one of our panelists is finished, we're going to allow some of your questions, and then we'll move on to the next panelist. We may have to cut the questions off if they get too lengthy, but what we will do, I will commit to you at uh, 2 o'clock, which is when the air show starts and we conclude this session, if you still have questions or comments, we will stay and uh, entertain those questions. So without uh, further comments on my part, let me introduce our first uh, speaker. Dennis Roberts is uh, formerly the uh, regional administrator in our Northwest Mountain region. Uh, he and I worked together for a number of years, and he has recently taken on a new challenge as the director for flight services operations for the FAA. Dennis? Thank you, Doug, and I have to say it's a real honor to be here at Lakeland this year for the Sun and Fun. This is my first opportunity to come to Sun and Fun. Uh, I'm happy to say I had the opportunity to get down here. I've been to Oshkosh probably more times than I want to think about, but it, uh, it's always a great privilege. My roots really are within general aviation. I spent uh, about three and a half years working for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association with Phil Boyer and have been a general aviation pilot since I was about uh, 17 years old. So it's a real privilege and honor to be here. It's kind of ironic that I'm in this new position, which I started just about the 1st of January this year, because it was during my days and years uh, working at AOPA that we actually started on Phil's request to look at the actual cost uh, and the services that the FAA was providing to us as general aviation pilots from the flight service perspective. And we did a, a close analysis of what actually it cost the FAA to give us a briefing versus what we as the general aviation community were paying for that service. And it was about a 10 to 1 ratio. It was about $22 to provide the briefing, and the general aviation community was providing about $2 back. So we recognized that it was, it was the one area within the FAA that we as general aviation pilots were very susceptible and very exposed uh, to the cost of, of the service. So it was at that time that we had made the recommendation that it was possible, and because particularly the fact that private industry could come forward with new technology at a much faster rate than the federal government could do, that it might be an opportunity to consider outsourcing uh, that program. That was followed shortly by a program and a process that the Office of uh, uh, Budget and Manage Management and Budget do, which is called the A76 process. And that's a process for evaluating and outsourcing federal government programs into the private sector. And as you all know, uh, back in 2005, that was completed and that, uh, that contract was awarded to Lockheed Martin Corporation. Lockheed Martin now has uh, the responsibility for providing flight services programs uh, on the lower 49, that's all the, the lower 49 plus Guam, uh, with uh, the state of Alaska, however, still being provided by the FAA and our own personnel up there. Lockheed has 
10 continuing sites for flight services around the country and three hub locations as well, uh, one in Ashburn, Virginia, one in Fort Worth, Texas, and the other one in Prescott, Arizona. Through that service, uh, my office and my responsibility and my job is to manage and oversee their performance uh, and to assure that they're giving the types of quality uh, and services to you as the general aviation flying public that's, that's needed. As I said, from the GA perspective, I hope I can bring a, a sense of reality to uh, what those really those needs are. We have 22 different performance metrics that Lockheed has to adhere to. We also have what we call credits and awards, where we assess uh, penalties to them for any types of service that they do not meet the standard on. And in those cases where they exceed the standard, they're, they're eligible for uh, an additional payment. But I, I'm happy to say that at this point, uh, we have, of those 22 items that we have that we measure them on every month, uh, they are in the green. They're meeting 18 of those 22, and we're working really hard with them to get the additional four up. The other thing that uh, we do in our office that we're very happy and we continue to provide, and that's through the Duots uh, vendor. Many of you are using Duots, and it's a service that, that I used at its inception back in the early days that DTN had it and they still are one of the two contractors that have it today. That's our internet portal that you can, uh, you can come on to uh, from your home computer. You can do your own weather briefing. You can insert your flight plan uh, and then get into the system just like you would normally. The other last thing that I'll, I'll just touch on, and that is the fact that our, our folks and friends up in Alaska, we're in the process of upgrading the backbone or the network system that we have in Alaska, which is called OASIS and that will continue to be provided by the FAA uh, employees and FAA operations in Alaska into the foreseeable future. Uh, it's extremely critical to aviation safety. All you have to do is look at the dramatic reduction in the accident rate, the fatal accident rate, particularly for general aviation in Alaska over the last five to six years, and you see how valuable and critical uh, these new technologies are. So with that, I'll stop and I'll look forward. To, uh, you want to do questions now, Doug? We have a couple of questions. Okay, uh, and uh, I'd welcome any questions that any of you might have. Uh, and as Doug said, I'll be around for a while afterwards uh, to talk with you individually if you'd like. Yes, sir. This is probably an answer I don't want to hear, but it was ten to one ratio of cost to expenses before you went with uh, Lockheed Martin. What's the ratio now? The ratio now, I don't have the exact dollar number it is now, but I can tell you that we track this every month, and that is the cost savings with regard to personnel and equipment costs and lease costs. Uh, over the 13-year period of the Lockheed contract, uh, we are on track right now to achieve our projected savings of $2.1 billion uh, over the federal cost. To give you some perspective, when we started the evaluation on the A-76, we had 2,600 FAA employees providing flight service station services uh, across the country. Uh, at the time, three years later, when Lockheed took the project over, that number was down to 23. And right now, Lockheed is doing the same services with just slightly over 800 people. So they're using a lot of the technology and the high-speed internet and the connectivity through their 10 continuing sites and the three hubs uh, with uh, a significantly number, a uh, smaller number of people than we had at the FAA with much higher reliability. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. And, and we will entertain some additional questions on these subjects later. I just want to manage our time so that each of our presenters can uh, give you a flavor for what's going on. And as I said, we will stay after the session's over uh, if you'd like to hear more. The next uh, presenter is Randy Fierch. Randy is the Director of Airport Compliance and Field Operations. FAA headquarters. His organization has been one that's been involved in this thing called recovery uh, and grants. I think we're in the process of finishing up $1.1 billion in grants. And let me stop and turn it over to Randy. Randy? Thank you, Doug. Uh, and thank you all for inviting me to uh, speak with you this afternoon. Um, as Doug mentioned, I, am, uh, I do represent our airports division. Our airports division has really three different functions. Uh, the first is to provide uh, grant money um, for, uh, cap to uh, uh, pay for capital improvements in airports. Uh, the second is the regulation, safety regulation and inspection of airports. And the third of which uh, 
uh, I'm responsible for is airport compliance. So in other words, to make sure that those airports that take federal money uh, comply with uh, the responsibilities that that entails, including access, of course, uh, to all of you as uh, general aviation pilots. I just very briefly wanted to go through uh, a couple of uh, issues that are uh, very, very uh, topical right now uh, to us in the airports. The first, as Doug mentioned again, is the uh, stimulus money that we received. Uh, we did receive $1.1 billion to fund airport capital improvements uh, through the uh, AIP uh, airport improvement uh, program process. And we're going to spend this money through the same requirements as existing AIP discretionary grants program. And uh, we are going to determine which projects get funded uh, through the existing uh, competitive process and our national priority system. In addition to that, all of the projects that we're funding under this program have to be completed within two years which means they have to be shovel ready at this time. In other words, uh, they're beyond the planning that they are, are really right ready for bid right now um, so that they can put this money to work uh, as quickly as possible. And as of April 22nd, uh, we have allocated of the $1.1 billion that we were, uh, that we were provided, we've, uh, we've allocated uh, just over one billion of that. So that's very, very quick and we're very pleased. And we believe that the, uh, the full $1.1 billion is going to generate uh, 30,500 jobs and uh, $5.5 billion in economic activity. The second area I just wanted to touch on is, of course, also very topical, and that is our bird strike database uh, that you may have seen uh, in the news very recently. Um, as you uh, may be aware, since 1990, we've been collecting information on bird strikes in a database that had not been made public. It was a voluntary disclosure uh, database, and um, uh, our FAA believed that we would get uh, more reporting if this was information that was, uh, uh, that was, that was kept within the agency. Um, however, as part of the normal process that we have on these things, we did go out with a public comment period for 30 days recently to solicit what, uh, what, what you all were thinking, what was the industry thinking uh, about this database. That period closed just this week and there were uh, a number of, as you can imagine, many comments we received. Um, and most of those comments were in favor of making the database public. So based on those comments, uh, and of course, uh, FAA input, the Secretary of Transportation made a decision this week to make that information, that database, public. And uh, I believe as of today, that database has been made public. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be working to uh, actually make the data a little more searchable and understandable because uh, it wasn't originally developed, as I said, to be a public database. So um, if you were to access it right now, you would uh, uh, see that there's a little more work to do in order to make it more uh, more searchable, as I mentioned. The final thing that's in the news, uh, again, just this week, uh, FAA uh, is, uh, has a role to play in the Congressional Airport Pilot Privatization Program, which, uh, um, which uh, allows up to five airports in the United States to be privatized. Uh, one of those may be a large hub airport, one of them has to be GA, and then there's three additional slots in there. Um, FAA's role is not to uh, not necessarily to, to support that program. In a sense, we're not pro or against uh, the privatization process. This is, a, this is a pilot program to see how it would work. Uh, we're, of course, interested to see if there's a way to bring more private money uh, into airports because that allows the government money that there is to be distributed uh, even further. Um, so we've been working with the city of Chicago on the privatization of Midway Airport uh, really for the last two years. And uh, they had uh, selected a bidder last fall, that bidder had been working to try to pull together the financing on that transaction. And uh, this week, the bidder decided, because of the current financial markets, that they were not going to be able to do that. So uh, that transaction has, uh, has fallen through for the time being. So that's, uh, those are three things I wanted to bring up right now and uh, ask you if you have any questions. Thanks, Randy. Uh, our next speaker has a, a very interesting job as manager of the small airplane directorate, uh, Kim Smith, 
uh, gets involved in a lot of activities, but she's involved in that one activity with the challenges and general aviation and everything going on that we're actually seeing some growth and some uh, positives occur. So let me introduce to you Kim Smith. Kim? Thanks. It's really good to be here again. I've been here a few years, and I have to tell you, for a second year in a row, wow, I just love Congressman Ehlers kicking this off. It's really nice to know that there's somebody in our Congress who understands this community and appreciates what GA brings, and especially given the turbulent times we're going through, I think it's good. Um, in the interest of time, I think I have just one, one bright spot I want to talk about that I think is very interesting that we're doing um, with an aircraft cert and, and the whole AVS organization, and that's our GA Joint Steering Committee. And when I say joint steering committee, I do mean joint. This, uh, this uh, team is led by industry and the FAA. And in fact, the industry leader is um, AOPA's um, Bruce Landsberg of the Air Safety Foundation. So it really is an opportunity for us to go out and find proact be proactive in looking for safety solutions. Um, right now, there's three subgroups. We have the personal aviation subgroup that's doing a lot of work, amateur built and also the turbine operations group. So it's something that we're doing uh, to be proactive, to try and enhance safety, and with a focus on non-regulatory ways. I think you're used to us getting up and talking about rules we want to impose. There is a lot we can do through education and awareness and reaching out and, and some of the great um, work that's already been done and new projects put out. So there's things to do. Your community is helping us move forward. And if you have any thoughts, let us know. And I know we're short of time, so how about I call that it? See if there's any questions. <coughs> Okay. All right, thanks, Kim. I would have thought you would have had a question or two, maybe later. All right, uh, let me introduce to you again John Duncan. He's the manager of the Air Transportation Division, FAA headquarters, and uh, he's got some interesting insight into what's going on in his area. John? Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to say on behalf of uh, Peggy Gilligan, the Associate Administrator for, for Aviation Safety, that she wanted to be here, uh, she planned to be here, and she was looking forward to it, and unfortunately she was uh, pulled off on another project and couldn't make it. Uh, John Allen, the Director of Flight Standards, would love to be here as well. He couldn't make it. So they came to me and they said, would you like to go to Sun and Fun? <laughs> and I, I actually contained myself and said yes only once because I got to tell you folks I, I feel like I'm at home I grew up on the uh, on the east coast of Florida near the Space Center that's where I started flying uh, when I was in high school over there we uh, I participated in building a breezy how many people know what a breezy is okay good you know what a breezy is um, I, I've still got a few scars I flew that airplane uh, a couple hundred hours I've still got a few scars from bug strikes those weren't those weren't report portable then Never hood a goose, but it was because it didn't go fast enough to catch one, is the, is the primary reason. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, to tell you that I'm, I'm pleased to be here. There are a lot of other people uh, with the same interests that I have uh, working within the FAA, particularly in the General Aviation uh, Division uh, that Ann is, is now running. And um, we are behind the General Aviation community and solidly behind, and we're continuing to, uh, to support I uh, also wanted to talk just a minute about uh, Amateur Built. Uh, amateur Built is uh, the only category of, uh, of general aviation now that is uh, where accident, the accident rate is going up, the trend is up. Uh, the, the, uh, as you probably know, the, the um, Amateur Built fleet amounts to about 30,000 plus airframes. I think you went over 30,000 last year at Oshkosh. And that amounts to, and you're doing about 3.5% of all the flying that's going on. And you're also having a large percentage of the, uh, of the accidents that are occurring, much greater than any other segment of aviation. More than half of those are loss of control accidents. Uh, stall spin, that sort of thing. Some of them are associated with power failure, but, but for power, power failure, it's a perfectly good airplane uh, when, when the accident occurs. So I would, uh, what I would ask you to do is, is uh, continue uh, to increase your vigilance, to use the EAA flight advisor programs, to use those things that are available to you, to do recurrent training, to make sure that you are current and, and that you can support that segment of the aviation community by flying safely and, uh, and getting where you want to be when you want to be. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to spending some more time with you. Any questions?
John, thanks. Uh, you've heard me say, and our next speaker who's joined us now for a couple years have said that uh, when you think about aviation, the one place where you have the highest probability for something bad to happen is on a runway. Uh, Wes Timmons is the uh, director of uh, runway safety for the FAA. Uh, he's, we've had some challenging times, but I think uh, even though those challenges continue, he'll have some good news for you as well. Wes? Thanks, Doug. Uh, this is the second year I've been here. Last year I came down and I talked to you about what was going on in the, in, in the industry, what was going on with runway safety, runway incursions and uh, gave you a briefing and talked a lot about the call to action. I thought I would tell you where we're at so far, kind of give you an update, and unlike the rest of them, I do have a few slides. And I'm going to take all the time they didn't use, and I'm going to take all your question time, and I'll be up here for the next four hours, because... <laughs> now, can I change? Okay. Um, so very quickly, this is where we were in the past. It looked like we were having pretty stable times, and it looked like in 07 things started to go south on us. And as you may recall, that was when we had the uh, call to action for runway safety. When we combined and looked at this data, surface incidents and runway incursions, and put it all into the same definition that we're using now, which you, I said last time that as of uh, the beginning of FY08, we started using the ICAO definition, which was included things we hadn't included in the past. You can see that over the last few years, there had been a steady increase in the number of surface incidents that are now reportable. And in fact, last year we had 1,009, over 1,000 runway incursions in the U.S. The serious runway incursion rate, although 07 was the best year of record that we had ever had, we in fact had at the end of the year an upward trend, and that trend was uh, continuing, and that called us to have the call to action in which we brought a lot of people into Washington and said, okay, some of these events are so close, if these aircraft actually collided, we'll do something different tomorrow than we will today. And what is that going to be? Let's figure it out now and do it now before two of them run together. So one of the main things that you're going to see at uh, all 139 airports is uh, enhanced taxiway center line marking. You may see any combination of this. Uh, runway guard lights, uh, I mean, the uh, whole line lighting, runway guard lights above ground. You've got the enhanced taxiway center line, which is the double dash on each side of the taxiway, 150 feet before the hold line. And in some cases, you're going to have runway guard lights going all the way around across the uh, intersection. This is going to be accomplished by 2010 at every Part 139 certificated airport. The CAS, the Commercial Aviation Safety Team, did a study of risk factors that lead to runway incursions. And here's the eight risk factors they thought were common to runway incursions. So as you look at things like airport complexity and taxi diagrams and hotspots, there's a lot of information that's going to be coming out on this. Bottom line, get a taxi diagram out and know where you're at on the airport. Air traffic procedures, we looked at what air traffic was doing that might have contribute to runway incursions. And we, in fact, were taking on the uh, uh, six of them that we're looking at and doing the safety analysis on, two of which already been, have already been implemented. So now when you get a taxi two, you no longer get just taxi two. You're actually getting specific taxi routing, and you're also going to have uh, a clearance to cross all intermediate runways before you get a clearance to take off on your departure runway. Some of the other things that are coming relatively soon, I expect uh, this fall, although I don't have a firm date, I expect the U.S. to change its terminology from position and hold to line up and wait, which is in line with the International Civil Aviation Organization uh, standards. And we're also looking at explicit runway crossing clearances. Um, I mentioned that uh, we started FY 08 uh, as a horrible year. We had 10 serious runway incursions in the first quarter. And we were able, because of the call to action and all the emphasis, and this has been the most intense 18 months on runway safety that I have ever seen in the 40-some years that I've been flying, we actually were able to arrest that uh, upward trend and finish the year almost as safe as we were the previous year. I'd love to take credit for it, but in fact, I'm out there in my plane trying to cause runway incursions. It really is a tribute to everybody in this room and everybody in the industry for stepping up to this. Number one cause of runway incursions continues. I said we had 1,009 last year. As of yesterday, we had 479 so far in the country. 74% caused by pilot deviations, 70% of those caused by general aviation pilots. Almost all of them is acknowledging a hold short instruction 
and then not complying with that whole short instruction. Almost all of them. Where we're at today, very quickly, we actually, for the first time in the last eight years, actually the last 11 years, are seeing a slight decrease in total number of runway incursions. They're trending down at about 4% right now, and I hope that's not just a reflection that nobody's flying anymore. And on serious runway incursions, we've had four so far this year. An unbelievable year. All of those are GA, uh, two of which are in the southern region. We're going to talk about that, Doug. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, three of those are pilot deviations and one operational error. Um, very quickly, some of the technology. You may have uh, heard that uh, we've turned on runway status lights at uh, LAX. They're going into uh, Boston next year. And by 2011, we should have runway status lights at at least 22 airports in the U.S. These are a series of lights which not only alert the controller but are direct input to the pilot to say it's either unsafe to take off or it is unsafe to enter or cross a runway from a taxiway. So we're working on those. That's kind of a picture of what they look like. On the left is uh, a sample of the taxiway lighting and on the right is the runway lighting. I talked fast. There weren't supposed to be any questions, Martha, but go ahead. Go ahead. Can you explain to me why you anticipate that the wording line up and wait will be more effective than the current wording position and hold? Well, it, it's uh, because global aviation, it's, it is a global business, and it doesn't so much hurt when foreign pilots come to the U.S., but internationally there's a term called taxi to the hold position which is amazingly like position and hold. In fact, they call it the whole point now because when they first started it, their terminology was hold position. And they changed that because it was so close to position and hold, they use a the term now taxi to the hold point. Well, um, a foreign pilot operating in the U.S. is told position and hold. If they get confused and think it's a hold point, they'll taxi short of the runway and stop. But internationally, U.S. pilots when they're told to taxi to the whole point, if they confuse that with position and hold, they go out on the runway in front of another aircraft. So as we, as we work in this global environment, we need to standardize and harmonize to the extent we can. And this is a situation where you, primarily U.S. pilots are having a problem in Europe and causing runway incursions, and, and several of them very serious in Europe. It's more of a fail-safe coming this way, but that's the reason we're doing it. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, Wes. And certainly in this part of the country, the eight state southern region, we are having some good results this year. Runway incursions caused by operational errors are down. The big one for me, runway incursions caused by pilot deviations are down. And uh, vehicle and pedestrian uh, deviation incursions are running on about a par with last year. So the numbers are better. We're making progress, but it's something that we have to work at, as Wes is well aware, every day. Uh, one other item in the safety arena, uh, the FAA has taken on a challenge to reduce the fatal accident rates over the next uh, 10 years uh, by 10 percent. And, and that's measured, of course, we do this uh, with a measurement of per 100,000 flight hours. I will tell you that we're doing uh, better than uh, then the goal that we set were actually an improved number over that and uh, still moving in a positive way. And when you stop and think about it, uh, there are some, some very positive things happening today in aviation. Let me just uh, mention one to you. I'm wonder wondering how many people recognize the name Doug White? How about Easter Sunday, Southwest Florida Airport, Fort Myers? Starting to see a few heads shake. Beach, Beach 200 King Air departed Marco Island. Pilot uh, slumped over the controls. And in the right seat was a general aviation, single engine rated pilot with 200 flight hours. who started flying in 1991. That gentleman was Doug White. And I think if you stop and think about the results of that, uh, pilot with his wife and daughters in the back, an incapacitated pilot who uh, later, of course, was determined to hit had uh, passed away on the flight, but uh, this individual, because of his piloting skills, had the presence of mind to uh, contact the air traffic controllers to work with them, a relay from a pilot uh, familiar with uh, this particular aircraft through the controllers, and his pilot was up in Danbury, Connecticut, 
but the system worked as it was envisioned to work, and this individual was able to land that aircraft safely with one loss of life, of course, not uh, related to the flight, but uh, for medical reasons. So you have some, some great stories in the, uh, uh, to counterbalance some of the other things that happened as well. Let me open it up now. We've got uh, a few minutes left, uh, and we're going to make a presentation here, probably the last five minutes of our session. I'm a big believer in what I like to refer to as catching people doing things right and then acknowledging them for it, and we have a very special recognition that we want to do the last five minutes, but let me open it up now to see if there are other questions uh, for any of our panelists that you'd like to ask. Looks like there's one in the middle there. We're not here. I don't think we've got a mic on. Have you got an on switch there? Head check. Has to do with aircraft maintenance. Uh, the field approval process, is there anyone here that, adjust, that can address that situation? Okay. From an operation standpoint, um, the, the answer really is we don't, I don't think we have anybody here who can deal with it directly, but we'll take your question. Go ahead with your question and we'll, uh, we'll take it back. The, get to uh, in aircraft maintenance, uh, we in general aviation in the past have been had good relations with the the general aviation district offices which now are the FISDO whereas they would approve uh, maintenance to an airplane which uh, was covered by a 337 form yes, sir. and that process has been mostly discontinued and it's a very uh, burdensome situation when it comes to maintaining airplanes and I wonder what caused the Federal Aviation Agency to decide that they do not want to have the responsibility of approving a field service I mean a field approval of a maintenance on an aircraft and uh, I, I it's I, I it's incomprehensible to me I've been in aviation and flying since 58 and maintaining maintaining airplanes and uh, it's a it's a burden and I wonder why thank you I, I can tell you that um, let's see I was I was in the Alaskan region up until 2006 uh, division manager there when when uh, probably in 2005 I, I think we took a look the, the our maintenance folks took a look at the way field approvals were being done in conjunction with folks in in uh, Kim's shop and uh, looked across the country to see how those were being done and, and we felt that uh, that the parameters that were set then were being exceeded in some places so the guidance was rewritten in order to try to bring that back in line and I know since that time there's been a, a considerable amount of heartburn uh, across the country um, but the, fo the right folks are out there I think to straighten that out if you have specific questions I would suggest that you get them back through your FISDO to uh, to the regional office uh, and and pursue those questions if you think that something should be field approved um, and is eligible field for field approval work with those folks I know in the past we worked with aircraft cert uh, at a field level uh, looking at at specific modifications or repairs to determine whether they do meet field approval criteria but that's the basic reason you want to add anything to that Kim I think the only thing I'd add is kind of go on like that. When we looked at um, what was happening in the field approval process, there were a lot of modifications being made that really rose to the level of supplemental type certificates, STCs. And so we we're trying to find the right balance. I'm not sure we're 100% there, but we do have a very good relationship between the, uh, the FISTOs and our aircraft certification offices and how we can have engineers step in and help with some of the data approvals for some of the repairs. But you can still do field approvals for the minor kind of things. So it just depends on where you draw the line and the, your local FISDOs and the regional offices can help if you think that line's not being drawn correctly. If you, if you still have some questions or some specifics, Don Veach, our Flight Standards Division Manager in the Southern Region is here and we'll, we want to be sure that uh, we fully respond to uh, that. Don, do you have any comments you want to make at this point? Okay, great, thanks. Other questions? Well, let's move on to our presentation and then we'll come back and if you've got a question uh, we can cover that as well but uh, as I said it's uh, it's really great when you we can recognize people doing some uh, some great things in aviation 
and we have an opportunity to do that today. Let me turn it back over to uh, John Duncan. And uh, we've got a, a presentation here. And uh, Fred, do you want to come up? Come up. You go ahead and open it up. You know, it's kind of exciting. John doesn't tell all the story. John doesn't tell the story that he, in fact, was my 200. He was my boss in Alaska. <laughs> and he's such a modest man. But truly, you know, when we look at things, how many of you ever wish that you could MC the Academy Awards? Anybody here? Okay. Well, today I have a chance to do that. And what I'm trying to find, of course, is a PowerPoint presentation, which may elude me. Um, yeah, there we go. We have a number of awards out here for pilots. And no matter who you are, where you're at today, just three letters can invoke all kinds of emotion in you. And those three letters are F-A-A, -A. okay? No matter where you're at, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've seen, they invoke three emotions in you. And we'll see if this thing loads up. If not, we'll just continue going on with it. The uh, I want you all to pay attention to this, okay? And for you guys up here, you can see your monitors here on both sides of you, okay? And um, Wright Brothers started it all and you know when you when you stop and think about where we've gone and 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 what we've done we we've, we've, we've covered so many miles today we're going to honor the guy that's covered so many miles in fact the guy that's spent over 50 years in aviation as a pilot as an instructor as a mentor and it, it just it, it just goes to show you that in in so many ways there is a synchronicity in aviation. There is a thread of, a, of, of all of us in aviation. The Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award is what we're here for today. It's named for the creators. It's a lifetime achievement for pilots, much like the, the Academy Awards are for an actor. And it was first authorized in 2003. And I'm gonna go through this kind of quick because I know everybody wants to get outside. 50 consecutive years as a CAA FAA pilot. Up to 20 years can be credited as military. U.S. citizen the whole time, and a current flight review, which means he has to be still an aviator. After 50 years, I don't think I want to do that. A clean pilot record, no revocation, civil penalties, or suspensions. Three letters of recommendation from the FAA 
pilots must apply to the FAA, can download the forms, of course, and the award can be awarded up to two years after posthumously. Special issue FAA certificate, and you'll see that shortly. A lapel pin, a lapel pin for his spouse, and the name inscribed in a roll of honor in the FAA headquarters. Now the reason the lapel pin for the spouse is so important is because behind every successful man is a hugely successful woman. All right? And you will meet that woman today. A distinguished chairman of honor, Larry W. Miller. Larry, come on up here. I want you to. Please be seated, okay? Because I could sit here and, and, and read a bio of this man, but I'm not. I'm going to read the three letters of recommendation to you from his peers. I'm writing this letter in regards to Lawrence D. Miller. I met Mr. Miller around the early 1960s. He trained me as a CFI for my private certificate in the early 1970s. I've been around Mr. Miller in the field of aviation and good friends for ages. To my knowledge, Mr. Miller has been associated with flying aircraft well over 50 years, a safe and extremely competent pilot and a mentor. For his many years of service in aviation, we owe him a great debt. <clears throat> that comes from a Mark P. Schaefer. During the past 20 years, both in flight schools and FAR 135 operations, I worked closely in phoning cockpits with Mr. Miller. During this time, I witnessed his ever relentless pursuit for the safety of others. An innovative teacher and precautious pilot, Larry Miller has become a mentor and a role model for many pilots who were fortunate enough to fly with him. Fred Longy. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. Um, it's such an honor to do this. I get choked up from time to time. I've known Mr. Miller for over 40 years. I've known him to be a fine pilot and an extraordinary instructor and mentor during his, this 40-year period. He owned an FBO in, um, in Michigan where I started flying 40 years ago. Absolutely wonderful mentor. I feel strongly that he should be awarded this award for over 50 years of flying. And to keep it short, let me run through something real fast. These are some pictures he sent, okay? <laughs> Just real quickly. Uh, him and his family. And of course, right there. Uh, but like I said, behind every successful man is a very successful woman. Congratulations, Larry. We appreciate you. Now I'm going to ask a couple more people to come up here, okay, because this is very important. Like I said, the FAA is a team. We're a family. We do what we do because we have a passion. And I'd like for, Doug, would you come up here and stand, please, with him? All right. And I would like for Don to come up and stand here, please. And I'd like for James King. Jim King, where are you at? To come over here. Our mission is possible because of these people you see standing up here. And I would like for you to give them a round of applause to thank them for who they are. Okay. I'm a very prejudiced man. I've saved the best for last, okay? I'd like to have Kevin Clover come up here. All right. Kevin Clover is the idea brainchild behind my team called the FAA Safety Team, the FAST Team. I'm sure you've heard of us. And we're putting a brand new face on aviation safety. In fact, he doesn't know this yet, but we're called the next generation, okay? <laughs> and anyway, this is all possible, again, by these people. Wherever you see these guys, thank them, because they make our jobs possible. Thank you, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.